Hi, it's Gadget UK here again, back for part two of the Megatech repair video. There'll be a link down below to part one. It's well worth watching that if you haven't seen it yet, because there's some interesting stuff in that video. And obviously, if you're jumping in here at part two, you're going to miss lots of stuff. So the way we left things in part one, we got the board up and running. We're waiting for the Sony uh, CDX uh, 1095Q, a data expander. I worked out how to boot the Mega Drive side independent of the menu, in case you've got a problem with the menu side. But there were some weird things going on with the slots that it was highlighting the wrong slot, it wouldn't seem to be on slot one. Um, and there were lots of little things we needed to look at, and there were still some outstanding faults, as you'll see. So, again, a huge thanks to Electron Ash for donating this to the channel. It's very, very, very much appreciated. And thanks to people who support me on Patreon Coffee as well, which makes a huge difference, as I mentioned in the previous video. So, my experience with a Megatech before receiving this from Electron Ash, um, when I was younger, I think when I was a around college time actually, I don't know, I was about 18, 19, maybe 20. Um, my friend Andy, uh, Woody, I used to spend quite a lot of time with him and meet him up in uh, Blackpool because he would go to a different college to me and we'd meet at lunches and stuff when he had a half a day. And we'd go to the Winter Gardens in Blackpool actually and they had a cabinet there. I'll show you a photo here just uh, briefly overlaid from Sega Retro. Uh, I'll link down below to their website, it's a great website. Um, yeah, so I, I played a Megatech in uh, the Winter Gardens and it was the first time I'd ever seen one. And I was a bit disappointed, I think my friend Andrew led me over to it and uh, I was straight away I saw Moonwalker on the list of games I was like oh wow I've got to have a go at that because I like the original Sega Moonwalker game not the Mega Drive port it's okay but it's not the same as the uh, you know the full blown Sega arcade uh, version so of course I put a pound in and then realised it was the Mega Drive and I was like oh god I've got a Mega Drive at home you know <laughs> what am I paying for here so then I think I loaded up Shinobi and again I was disappointed because it was the Master System version of Shinobi. Uh, anyway, uh, the first thing I'm going to show you in this video is I just need to quickly throw together a video connector, you know, to get RGB out on the Mega Drive because we haven't seen video on the Mega Drive side yet. These are Molex connectors, uh, 2.54 pitch, um, and it's a full kit. Now, it's got the six pin connectors I need here for the video connector because at the moment we've got one soldered on haven't we and there's no resistors there so whilst my tv is quite happy with that you could damage your tv because it's probably going to be outputting ttl level sync that's what most arcade uh setups usually do uh, i'm pretty sure the mega drive outputs uh, that sort of level uh, i don't think there's any, any attenuation there you know it's going to have uh, you know in mind uh, arcade monitors and things like that uh, which are going to be ttl level uh, anyway so i've got some resistors here 330 ohms, um, I should have some caps as well, but I'm just going to go with the resistors, because I know my TV's okay so far with the signal actually, and the, the other video cable on there's not got any resistors or anything. Uh, I'm just going to wire it up to this, it's just going to be a short extender, nothing tidy or clean or presentable about it. Um, I'm not even going to heat shrink the resistors at the moment, just until I've tested it. Ultimately it's going to be red, green, blue, and then we've got uh, sync and ground and then we obviously need to switch the uh, TV into RGB mode. Now you saw right at the start there was that red wire wasn't on the other one and I just soldered it via a 100 ohm resistor to the 5 volt rail. So I'll do a similar thing but I'll stick a little clip so you can actually clip on somewhere on the board for the, the 5 volts there through a resistor. Like that, as close to the bottom of it as you can. So I've cut the end off my wire, I'll just uh, twist it around itself like that. You want the, the bottom spades, you know, they stick out like that on the bottom of the connector. Over the top of the sheath there, can you see that, you know, the plastic covering? And then just solder that centre point down there. And there we are on macro, so you can see, you know, that the wire is in the centre piece there, soldered. You're supposed to crimp those two things, but you know what, I found that crimping them is generally unreliable. Um, and then the final thing to do here is just squeeze these wings here together just to grip the cable, could do with a bit more there anyway, you get the idea. And the final step is to get it that way up where you've got the little metal thing there, and that goes into uh, this side here with the little slot, you know, the little slot there is what captures that as you push it in. Click, there you go, that's it, that's not coming back out. So, yeah, I'm having to straighten these a little bit because this wire had a, a bend in it. Yeah, there's going to be nothing tidy about this, I'm not even using different coloured cables, which you could do. There's just no point, it's just going to be a temporary adapter that's just going to plug onto the board there and provide me with a scar socket. Right, let's give it a try. I've got it connected up. You can see it's just a bit flaky here at the moment. You're better off having the resistor in the middle of the wire and then a wire to the hood here because a single strand, you know, a single wire, will, a single coil will break much easier than flexible multi-strand. 
um, but this is just for testing purposes. You can see for the moment the 100 ohm, uh, you know, the switching signal is going for a 100 ohm resistor here, and I've got it connected there. I'll do something proper later. This is just for testing. So let's see now if we're getting any uh, RGB video out of the Mega Drive side. Of course, I could connect up uh, my monitor later so I can have the monitor and the TV. So let's switch it on. So ignore the tone, and I'm going to short those connections together. That should beat the Mega Drive. Hey! Fantastic! Sweet! Looks perfect! So I finally worked out how to adjust the volume. There's two of these. I was just using one of them and it was super loud. If you use the other one, it's like a master one, which makes it even lower. So, you can hear, it's not too bad there. Now, when that leave this running in a track mode like this, you know, I have to force the Mega Drive into a reset. After a fixed amount of time, and it's always the same amount of time, it freezes. You'll hear it in a minute. So it's at this point in a sec. There we go. The other thing I've noticed, and I mentioned it yesterday, there's something flaky around here, and I think it's this ROM socket, because the pins just look awful. So I think the next thing I'm going to do, after I've just shown you a quick bit of gameplay there, is remove that and clean that socket, and all around there actually, with uh, some vinegar, and the Z80 socket as well. So what I'll try and do here is cut to showing you the other screen actually. So we'll put that screen on, first of all, the menu screen. You see we've got black screen, touch the wires, the game starts, hang on it hasn't done that time. Yeah, just occasionally, if you bounce the contacts, it won't start. It's got to be a clean touch and release. So I'll do that again. Yeah, there we go, that's start. You can hear the game. Just remove the video, plug it into the other cable. And then we should get video, there we go. The cool thing with this is obviously there's no jail bars either. No jail bars compared to my other Mega Drives. It's, you know, the blue at the top up here is perfect, absolutely perfect, which is kind of what you'd expect because there's uh, no encoder. And I think it's the, it's the rooting of the traces that go to the encoder on Mega Drives that causes that a lot of the time. So this is the point where it always freezes. It's always as... Uh, Gilius is jumping in the air, or Gilius is it called, jumping in the air, about to slash a skeleton with his axe, watch. Oh, there we go, sorry, it's the other way around, it's when the skeleton's about to slash him. And I know that because I've watched this several times, it always freezes there. Now, if I touch the contacts together again, hang on, it doesn't reset. It doesn't reset. That shows me that the output of that CXD chip is not low. Now, if I force the uh, reset low, there we go. So that resets the Mega Drive side, but then it just sits there. And I think what's going on here, the master system menu side is pointing at the wrong slot or something. I still think it thinks it's got more than one game in or something. That would make sense with it always occurring at the same point. I think it's a timing thing. It's perhaps trying to cycle the slots or something. So the next thing I want to focus on here is the controller input issue. And you know what? There might be nothing wrong with the stuff we've looked at so far. What I mean is these might not actually be the issue here. It could be that it's causing some sort of unexpected uh, crash to occur in the Z80 because all of the inputs are high, like every single one, the test input, every direction, every button. This is what I think might be the issue with this, because none of the controller's uh, inputs work. I mean, it could still be that this is faulty, but none of the control inputs work. And they've got these little NEC things here, and they're like optos, as I mentioned earlier. So, the bottom two pins, you've got a uh, emitting LED, you know, a, a light emitting LED, infrared probably, or something inside there. So, you know, it's the anode and the cathode. And then, on the other side, you've got a photosensitive transistor. Uh, now, that's the side that gets monitored by here, which makes sense. So, I was puzzled thinking, how, what I was trying to do was put my logic probe on and detect a signal change. I'm getting nothing, nothing on here at all, which could indicate these are faulty. But they're measuring the voltages on here. The uh, cathode side, I think, goes to the actual pin, you know, it goes to the button. The anode side's got literally nothing on it. 
on any of them. So I'm wondering if there's like a separate little transistor or something that drive a resistor that uh, current limits the supply to these, and maybe that's gone. It could be that simple. That could be the entire fault with this board. Wow, is this going to be the most uh, incredibly frustrating repair ever? I think what's happened, I've traced this. The uh, resist There's a resistor pack that feeds each of these LEDs, and every single one of them, the pin one, hang on, join together. So I'm like, okay, so where do they go? Well, they don't, there's no voltage there. Um, they go to this connector here, hang on, that's marked five volts, those two pins there. I think, and I'll show you this, if I short one there, the measure to five volts here, they've got no join. There's going to be one of these little things here, probably, you know, an EMI coil thing, or a resistor li linked to the 5 volt rail that feeds the power to all of these, you know, the opto, uh, you know, the LEDs on this side. Because they're not there, I think it's going to be registering as an input, no matter what, on every single input. But uh, yeah, nevertheless, that, that is the issue. I could just temporarily bridge between the 5 volt rail here to these pins here, which would then power these, and then input should start working, I think. So I'm not sure if that was clear, but those two pins on the select um, connector there, that I said 5 volts, they are both marked as 5 volts, but as I showed on connectivity, there was no connection to the VCC pin. So I don't know where the trace or whatever is broken. I've checked everything. I checked all the little EMI things down here. I can't work it out. Um, you know, there's that many components on the, the top side here. You'd have to remove them all to probably work out where the trace has burned out. But at some point in the past, I think someone shored that 5 volt connector there to ground, and that has burnt out the trace, which means that the little, res you can see them here, the silhouette underneath, this is the resistor pack, yeah? One there, one there, one here. Those resistor packs, as I say, the, the pin one on each one of them is supposed to connect to there, which it does, but then also connect to five volts. And I found five volts just up here. That's what this wire is. We're reintroducing five volts to those two pins, which provides each of these resistor networks with a five volt supply. And then each of the individual connections on these resistors here, they all go to the you know individual LEDs on the uh, NEC uh, you know optos there. So the inputs here working. I'll show you that if I just power this on, I've joined up the reset, so it's just going to sit there on a black screen. And if I probe say any of these pins here, you can see we've got high now. We didn't before; they were all flowing before. And if you pull them low, you can see on the transistor side on this side the state change. So the inputs are all fixed now. That's the first time I've seen that since I've been looking at this. In retrospect, when I saw there were floating things here, I should have dug a bit deeper, but I just assumed you could have, you know, it was like high impedance and ground. You know, you pull it to ground and it would de detect that, but obviously, you know, that five volt rail was missing for all the LEDs on there. But this is still not doing anything different. You remember earlier on in the video, I was showing that the chip selects for that chip and that chip come from this gal. Uh, so it's like that pin, that's pulsing, it's looking at this one up here, the dip switches that isn't there, and that one, that's just high. Now, it could be as a consequence of, uh, it can't read that one, it's not able to look at that one, but I'm sceptical, I am sceptical, because it's going to read high, with, with that missing there, it's going to pick up whatever's on the bus, so like highs or lows or whatever. So unless maybe that's causing it to, I don't know, keep looping for some reason, I can't see it being the case that because that's missing it's not looking at this one. Because the other thing is if we bypass, and I'll show you that, if I disconnect these wires here, and there we go, it's come out of the menu. Hang on, let's just power the cycle again. Because we can get it so it loads the game, short them together, hang on. Right, that's the Mega Drive reset, it's sat there, it's flashing away with the message, you can hear it. So you would think at this point, it would be looking at this input here, ready to receive credits and things. Having said that, we tricked it, didn't we? So, I don't know, maybe not. Um, it's just high. Chips like for this chip here is just high. Not even looking at it. I'll put the original gal back in there, but I don't think that's the issue. I think there's something ro wrong around here. So I fitted that chip on there again, and it's just black screen and can't get it to boot at all. So, I probed the uh, two chip selects here again, 
I'm not sure if I mentioned that. And uh, it's doing very little. You know, that chip down there, no activity. This one, a little bit. But then just, I don't know, it's just crazy. So I was suspecting something here. Swapped the gal again. And then I thought, well, let's have a look at the wires. There's a fixed wire, or there was, between here and here. And uh, I removed that chip, checked all around it, no damage, removed this chip, can you see here, pad missing, pad missing, 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 missing. Uh, but there's just one trace that goes to those pads that are missing, they're not important, they're not connected on the top side, you know, on the bottom side they are joined up properly. Nevertheless, this is the one that had the wire, and it doesn't go to this chip, as it was wired, it goes to the gal. This is going to be the problem, this, I think, is why this is now not working. There might be another problem. I don't, I don't think this is the original fault, but uh, it could be. Bear in mind, we fixed the controller input issue. That might have been causing some strange things to, to occur. But also, these could still be playing up, but nevertheless, this is the problem. This is why the chip selects on these are acting a bit strange, and I think strange things are going on. So I think we're there. You can see I've removed that chip again because obviously that was just causing the total black screen. And I think that chip was faulty, you know, when it was in this position here. So I'm going to leave that one on. We're going to test that in a minute with inputs to see if we can get into test mode. I'm fingers crossed because I've just checked the output enables here and I'm seeing activity on here. So I've just connected it all back up to the TV. If I switch it on now, I've got the reset for the Mega Drive connected up as normal. So there's no modification. Can you hear it? Straight away. Now the only strange thing is we've still got slot 5 highlighted yellow and if I try it in any other slot uh, you'll see, let me try the second slot, you'll see it doesn't detect the game. So there could be another problem here, but that might be, it might be reliant on that uh, last chip at the back there, that might be doing the slot change, I honestly can't remember which one of the CXD chips is doing it, but you'll, if I power it on now you'll see it just doesn't detect it, but it works, you know this flashes here. It's not freezing like it was. It works no matter which slot you put it in. If I put it in slot 8 and power it on, it's just uh, way better than it's ever been. You can see, look, flashing away there. Not crashed at all. And if I put it back in slot 1 and power it back on, totally reliable, works every single time. There you go. So, working every single time. So let's test the inputs next. See if we can, uh, I don't know, get a credit in or go into the service menu. Let's try that. So if we look with the logic probe now, you can see we've got inputs here, you know, this wasn't happening before. So let's just try, uh, I think pin 8 is the test one. one two, three. So if we hook onto pin 8, and uh, let's just pull that low. Yeah, look, it's gone test mode. Woohoo! Fantastic! Now, it's not got any further, has it? So, <laughs> what's happened there? Has it crashed? Are we supposed to press a button? I don't know, let's try pressing uh, a button, I guess. I need to look at the pinout here for the control inputs. So that is the first time I've uh, seen test mode. Well, test mode just says test mode and doesn't do anything. Now, I know in MAME you can actually get into the service menu. I'm not sure if I'm doing it right, but if I press the enter button, because it says there, press select or enter. Press enter, watch what happens. We get the instructions. Fantastic. And look at the timer there, it's like pretty uh, high actually, it's uh, 70 minutes. Now when I hover near the board, you can see it goes purple. I don't know if that's just me interfering with the connection somewhere or what, but I literally just have to be near stuff and uh, that happens. I'm not sure what's causing actually. Is it the RGB cable? Did you see the background change there? It was white a minute ago. What is going on here? I've got a loose connection there, like I'm just pressing down around the ramp. Let's just press around there. Let's just cycle the power. I think there is a bad connection. I haven't cleaned around that ROM yet. Maybe that's the issue. Because I've been able to select the game there, I've been able to start the game. You know, it's got 70 minutes on it roughly at the moment. And if I press the buttons here, let's start, I think. There we go. So I can't use the controller at the moment because I'm just using a wire here to <laughs> press things. Hang on. See if we can move. Yeah, so we can move up. See which direction we've got. Up, down, left, right. Attack. Hang on. Can't see what I'm doing here. Then we've got jump. 
and um, that was pause I think. It's interesting you can pause it in the arcade. <laughs> the pause is probably the start button. Yeah that's really cool. Uh, so the random resetting, you know I showed you before, it was resetting at a certain point, that stopped as soon as we fixed that problem with the gal, which makes sense because I think what actually happens is when you've not got any credits in, when that would normally hang the system, it actually resets the game. So it's like the attract mode goes on for about roughly, I don't know, a minute and a half, two minutes, and then it goes on to the next game, or it just resets the same game, unless you've got time. You know, you've added credits, and if I switch over to the uh, main console screen here, there's obviously MV RAM in there that's holding the settings, and you can see the, the timer there. See, it's on 56 minutes, watch. If I switch this off, and we power cycle it, I don't think it's just going back up to a predetermined value. I think, hey look, it's still got the same amount on it. That is very interesting. So it's not doing timekeeping, it's just going, all right, we, we're into a, 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 you know, an increment of a five minute section, just deduct it in the settings and then you know store that in the MVRAM and then if the power is lost, all you've lost is five minutes, but nevertheless, that seems to be how it's working. Yeah, look down to 20. <laughs> so I'm just going to remove the uh, CPU. You can see it came out pretty easy. It perhaps could do with a new socket. Same with the ROM here, but I'm just going to clean these up with a little bit of vinegar, especially this one. Can you see? They're really dull. I've joined the Mega Drive S res, the reset, back up again. Um, because as far as I'm concerned, I think all this needs now is the new CXD uh, chip for down there. But there may be another fault because it still, like I say, is not detecting games in any slot but the first one. So maybe there's another issue. Maybe it's another trace where it shouldn't be or something like that. You know, a wire, fixed wire that's incorrect. So then I'm just uh, tilting the board down this way a little bit. Because then I can not only clean uh, here, you know, I've obviously removed that chip a second time there. We've got lots of flux leaks under the edges of these things here. We'll get a little bit of IPA there now. So the next thing I'm going to do is clean up under here. So we've ended up with... Uh, I forget which one fixed what now. There was one that was obviously going the wrong way, and then we've ended up with a couple more fixed wires. Certainly on this chip here, you can see we've got two extra wires here, because th these chips have been removed, you know, twice now. And Electron Ash did warn me in advance that the pads are really bad on these. If you use just slightly too much temperature, um, they will come off. Uh, so he'd lost a few, and I know that because when I lifted. The two chips that I removed, or three chips I think round here, that I removed to check underneath. Uh, one or two of them, the pads were all missing on the top side of the board where there were, you know, the no traces go to them. So it was very clear to me from when I removed the very first one that it's easy to lose pads. And in fact, when we removed that CXD chip earlier, we lost one of the unused pads there, didn't we? So the pads do not uh, survive well on these at all. You've got to use uh, a lot lo lower temperature than normal and even then when you remove something more than once you start to lose things so anyway I'm just going to go around this with uh, as you can see cotton buds initially just to focus the cleaning and then I'll get the toothbrush and IPA and have a good scrub around you can see there's like contaminant on here I don't know what that is I'm now going to start cleaning the top side of the board. Can you see? It's absolutely filthy, you know, between these slots here. Now, there are traces on this side of the board, so you never know. Maybe there's a damaged trace. Because the thing that's puzzled me at the moment is the whole, why is it selecting slot 5? Yeah, all right, we're missing one of the I.O. chips there. But I just find it a bit weird that it stays on slot 5. It makes me think there is still something else on this board. So later the same day, you know, I had a bit of a clean up here before. It's There's lots of areas I haven't focused on and I haven't finished cleaning it by any stretch of the imagination. So you can see, I programmed some more cars. I've got Moonwalk and E-Swap. And if I fill the slots up, I'll just switch this on, show you what it's doing. It does report eight slots. That's the nice thing. And this is the interesting thing. Moonwalker, Moonwalker, Moonwalker. The colours are correct now because I'm using my... I've removed that cable that was, uh, you know, on the on the motherboard there for the RGB. Just use my connector and I can just unplug it and plug it in as I need it. 
so you can hear Michael <laughs> in the background there. Um, so obviously it's working, but it's not cycling the slots, it stays on slot one. Now, I know what the problem is, let me show you. Now, I'm just going to have to swap the games around here, because otherwise I'm going to get like a crazy copyright strike based on uh, the uh, noises Mr. Jackson is making in the background. I really don't want that. So, I'll put golden axe in there now. So I was looking at the partial schematics that Electron Ash uh, produced. Let me see if I can turn it down a bit. Hang on. Yeah, that's much better. Uh, so looking at those schematics, it, the guy is great. He's, uh, he's done such a great job there. And I was looking at uh, these uh, 138s here because I thought it's going to be one of these. They've got a number of outputs. One of them does eight output enables for the SMS side of things, for the menu, I think. And I also saw... Uh, the chip enable for all of these slots, eight outputs, and I think that's on U4, might not be U41, I think it is U41, and there are three inputs to this, it's uh, uh, a DMUX, so you have three inputs, and the flowing, look, flowing, 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 ABC, and it's the same with the other chip, so the reason it's not able to go up the slots here, it's not able to get the tile either, is it's stuck on slot one, because this chip here, this 138, and the other 138, which is one of these here, They've got no inputs, yeah? Nothing at all. So it can't enumerate, that one's a different chip I think. Yeah, it can't enumerate the slots. It, it can see, somehow it's able to detect these eight games in, probably because of the cart detection pin, that's on a different, picked up by a different chip. So it's able to go, oh yeah, we've got these, these carts and these slots, but he doesn't know anything beyond slot one. And that also explains why when you test it with one car, it can't detect the one car in any slot other than the first slot, yeah? Because when it goes to pick the game title up, it's always looking at slot one and goes, oh, there's nothing there. So you ain't got any carts in. Despite the fact it probably is detecting, you know, the C detect, or whatever is the cart detect pin on each of, you know, the, the slots there, depend, you know, whichever slot you put it in, that is working. So I thought, I bet it's that CDX uh, or whatever it is, uh, CXD, I uh, keep getting it wrong, over there. And uh, lo and behold, the tested connectivity between these first three pins, this isn't on the schematics as far as I can see. Yeah, these three that are floating, they go up here, and you can see obviously the floating, it's like the first, uh, and two here, and then this one I think. So you know what, we can trick it. If I feed a, let me think about this, it's three bits isn't it? With three bits you can get eight, eight locations. Um, yeah, that makes sense, because if you think about the, the value of those binary bits, you've got one, two, four. If you add those together, it gives you seven, and with none of them, non set, you've got an eighth location. So you've got eight bits with, uh, you know, eight slots, eight outputs from three input bits. That's what it's doing. It's kind of like a, um, it's taking those three bits and exploding them out into eight you know, eight, eight uh, separate bits, if you sort of mean. So I felt it was worth expanding there on our 138 DMUX. And what what does DMUX and the MUX mean? When you uh, MUX something, you are encoding it. So if you, it all will become clear actually, if I just put the binary weightings of these on here, because what we've got, we've got three inputs here, and we're converting from three bit binary to eight separate outputs. Uh, I'm just gonna write, on there so it's obvious uh, outputs so this is our list of our eight individual outputs and there are eight pins on that chip for that uh, and these three here are inputs I'll just put in yeah so coming back to what I was saying about uh, MUX and DMUX when you MUX something you are encoding it so if you look at the binary weightings here and this combination this is all the combinations of zeros and ones that are possible you've got eight different uh, combinations of ones and zeros there uh, that give you your eight possible values and that's what I meant a minute ago when I was showing you my fingers you know if you add them all together if you had one two and four it gives you seven and then with none of those bits set you've got eight so those are your eight locations there um, and in, in terms of how that works you know zero 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 well you can have a high here uh, and then all the other seven outputs will be lows and the next position here um, and these aren't in numerical order here actually. The next one would be uh, you know, A high and B and C low. So that's this combination here, yeah? And if you add A high, all that's gonna give you is one. So that's how you would get slot one. And then again, all the other outputs, so if you look at the right number of zeros, are all low. Um, and then when you come to the next bit, how do you get bit two? Well, you just have a, a high 
on B here so that's that example there where A and C are low but B is high so that gives us a 2 now you might be wondering how do you get 3 yeah because we've got 1, 2 and 4 how do you get 3 well you just add those two, one and two. If you add one and two, that's going to give you three. So therefore we need a situation where A and B are high and C is low. And that would be this one here. Yeah, That line there is three. Because you've got one plus two gives you three. So that would be slot three. So when the, the numeric values of these were encoded in this three bit form here, that's multiplexing. And then you demux it or decode it to get you know the original output eight separate things you know if you do this in reverse and take eight inputs like this and convert them into a three bit binary like that that's where you are multiplexing if we put a high on one of those three bits there we're going to shift things around we might be able to get this last slot working um, but of course it's going to, you know, if you do that when it boots it's going to think every game is called that because it's always going to be looking at that slot if that makes sense so at the moment it's showing Golden Axe because that's the game in the first slot. Let's go with the first bit. So if we look at U41 and let's just hook this onto its first pin. Yeah. So that's the first bit. And let's just feed it a, uh, what should we feed it? A high. So it's, instead of being zero, it's now a one. And it will always be a one because obviously we've got that perm attached there. And if we switch it on, it should show Moonwalker, I think. Let's try that and see what happens. Yeah, there you go. And uh, I'll just do this while you're watching, so I'm going to switch it off, I'm going to unclip that, and I'm just going to hold the clip, I'm just going to hold it on the second pin, so, hang on, now that, I've got to try and do the maths now, uh, if I do the second one, that's going to be slot two, isn't it? So let me move e -swap down to slot two, and I'll show you this in a minute so you can see the order. So I'm going to force this now, in fact, we'll boot it the first time without, just so you can see, that should say Golden Axe, I think, yeah, Golden Axe, yeah, we've got three, three, populated there and if I short out bit two with a high well not short it out but feed it a high and if I connect the power again I think I should now show eSWAT as the title for all three games yeah there you go <laughs> and if I switch the power off again and I short pin one again it should show Moonwalker for all three games there you go <laughs> and obviously it's loading the game that it's showing you can hear Moonwalker there right the ICs have arrived you can see them three here taped to a piece of card with bent pins uh, vacuum you know sucked out of this in a plastic bag inside some plastic bubble wrap just for maximum ESD static generation so hopefully these are fully charged up and raring to go they do look brand new to be fair um, as long as they're not fake as well, which, uh, yeah, I think there's lots of these in stock, so there's no reason to fake them. Um, and they're not exactly cheap, I think about six or seven or eight pound each actually. As part of this series, there's a Patreon only video for this. Um, I'm doing some exclusives now for Patreons, I've got to put some incentive there because uh, I've had one or two people leaving. They've supported me for a while and left because there's no exclusives. So, uh, yeah, I mean, no exclusives. I would say there's like seven, six or seven videos up there at the moment that aren't public. So, you get an exclusive early access, but I'm doing a behind the scenes on this one. It's only going to be a short video, but it's just some extra stuff that I'm not showing, uh, you know, publicly. Um, it's covered in other ways of the videos and things so you're perhaps not missing too much but that might be later it might be late before i cover anything like that publicly so the video is covering reversing the uh, jed uh, you know the equations from the jed file for the chip selects on the uh, the chip that provides the chip selects for these actually so i've already done that and i'm confident that chip selects are okay so this should work this should fix it where's pin one now i've lost it it's here you can see that little white dot and there's a slice there look uh, that corresponds with the the dot there. Uh, got a hair on that actually. So let's just carefully put that on there. When I removed that chip for the second time, uh, I used the low melting point solder again, and again reclaimed it using my uh, solder sucker. I'm pretty sure the code is right there. C X D 1095Q. Uh, so it does look new as well. We'll just uh, add a little bit of solder there. There we go, that's one pin soldered, and a couple there, look, just press it down. It is nice and flat, 
I think this is going to go on better than the, the ones that were already on there. I think those have been swapped around at some point in the past, if I'm honest. Let's just uh, just do that side again and just put a tiny bit of pressure up there. Um, yeah, that's spot on. So let's get a little bit of solder on here. And I'm going to try and do uh, the side now because obviously I've anchored it there and there. Grinding noise, or not grid grinding, bouncing noise there. That's bouncing up down the pins. Can make you think I put a lot of force on, but I'm not. Uh, and you can see that side has come out pretty good actually, just from a couple of quick passes there. A bit more solder. Let's try and do this side. I should remove the cartridges actually because the cartridges are in there at the moment and it's just making it a bit uh, more difficult for clearance, you know, actually reaching and soldering these things up. So you can see the bridges we had there were cleared on that side. So just do the same thing on the other two sides. I'm not even going to clean it up, then we'll go try it. Yeah, I've been using a mixture of the ATX power supply and the uh, Agilent actually. So I'm just connecting everything back up here. Uh, we've got the connection here for the RGB switching because it needs 5 volts and there isn't there are others oh, not 5 volts on the connector. Obviously it's not designed to use the SCART this, this is designed for use with the CTL monitor. So that's everything there. We'll connect it up to the select pin. That should change the slot and we'll power it on. So the TV's on. If we just watch the power light here, I'm just gonna watch that IC and, and finger touch that IC, make sure it's not getting red hot. And it isn't. Golden axis on. Got no sound at the moment. I'm just gonna just test it myself. Hang on. Uh, yeah, so good news is it's booting there with golden axe, that's slot one. If I press the select button, hang on a sec. So select pressed. I think that's old beast, yeah it is, look, it's going up the slots now. The next one should be Moonwalker, I think. Woohoo! That works. And the vinyl slot, slot eight, is E swap. Oh yes, and then it should go back round to golden axe again. Fantastic. Let me switch to the uh, menu RGB output so we can see what the menu looks like now. Bear in mind, I've not got attenuation on the menu, so it's going to look over bright. I'll show you that in a minute. Um, so I really should stick some resistors on the uh, the other side as well, you know, on the menu side we're going to look at here. Look at that. Fantastic. It's got the correct game names. And that should be reflected when I press select. Let me just turn the sound down a bit. Hang on. We don't need it that loud. You can see though, it is, it's bright, it's over bright because it's not got the attenuation. So just watch if I a short ground, look, Altered Beasts. Why does it say Beasts with an S on the end? Moonwalker. I'm not sure I noticed that extra S on the end of Altered Beasts before. But yeah, it's going round, look, no worries. Problem solved. And of course, we can uh, add a uh, coin. So here's the pinout of one of those CMOS I.O. port expanders and that's what they are, those CXD 1095Q chips. Now, I, did, I will admit that I looked in advance of this board arriving what the common faults were. I only found, I think, two repair locks and in both cases, some of the faults, because it wasn't the entire fault, were these chips. So I had a good uh, insight, if you like, that these may be the issue. But I think one of the things Electron Ash said, they've been swapped or swapped around. I don't know whether he did it or someone else did it. It might be that someone swapped them around and then sold it onto him and told him that they'd been swapped. But again, that was one of my questions, you know, where did they come from? Because they were taken from another board. There's a good chance one of them's not going to be right, isn't it? Um, and that obviously wasn't the only fault. Uh, but nevertheless, it uh, seems to be a common thing on these. So if you pick one of these up and it is faulty, um, I would start by getting some of those as replacements. But as you saw, earlier on in the in part one um that's probably my midway through part one you can remove them the system the menu side you know the zh on the menu side should boot without them so that is a good test and i think what was happening here i speculate this was killing the data bus if i'd scoped it we might see some evidence of that uh, but there were obviously a number of issues with this board so that on its own wouldn't have been the uh, only problem and it might not have revealed anything we may have seen everything okay on the data bus but you can see all the pins here and it's like mostly i opens there's tons of i opens there are some inputs there for control of some latches and things as you'll see in a sec when i show you the, a, a diagram that represents the inside of it but it's mostly i opens it's a huge io chip and on this overview diagram here you can see it's like a block diagram d0 to d7 so you've got an 8-bit data bus that feeds in 
and out of this you know it seems buffered there i think that indicates it's output uh, enable control which makes sense so it's got an output enable somewhere um, and then you've got all these latches here you've got one two three four five latches and you've got blocks of io here so you've got port a port b port c port d and port x now port x seems to go to this data select uh thing here which uh yeah, I'm not really sure what's going on with that. Um, but nevertheless, these are other ones. These are the latches here, if you look at those. Um, you've got PA0 to PA7, a bit like you'd see on a CIA or a VIA, actually. Uh, PB0 to BB7, same again, because you usually have two 8-bit uh, ports on those devices. PC0 to PC7, so another 8 bits there. D0 to D7, another 8 bits there and then X0 to PX3, so you've got four bits there. So it's, you know, it's quite a lot of I.O. you can get through there. And that's where it's useful, because we've only got our 8-bit data bus here. So using those control signals in the data selector register there, I think you've got you know an 8-bit window there, you know, out into numerous uh, you know peripherals if you like numerous things on the board numerous buses so this is the sort of thing that's super super useful i'm not sure what other equipment out there uses this if you're aware of any other arcade boards or computer hardware that use this uh, cxd 1095q please post in the comments below i'm just interested to see how widely used it was you know it's a generic device designed by Sony and Sega at the time when they were developing and designing this board obviously saw a data sheet for it and thought hmm we could use that that would be uh, pretty useful and it was probably cost effective at the time and then you've also got a control register or something here you can see the right pin goes to that the read pin it's got a chip select look uh, and uh, a reset so the way that works, and a bit of a correction here, when I said uh, port X comes through this data select, all of them do. If you look at the input side here, all of the inputs actually go through this data select. So the way it works is it can read from the 8 bits, you know, you've got 8 bit, 8 bit, 8 bit, 8 bit, 4 bit, I think. It can read through, yeah, with the output enable control onto your, your 8 bit data bus here. But in terms of output, you can actually write to these latches yeah um, and then latch it and this is where the name latch comes in it's like you know you write it you latch it and it stays there you know the eight bits you've written they're going to be st st stationary yeah now the benefit there and because of the output enable control thing here you know that can be off the bus so you can have written values that you want to go out there and they can pass through with the output enable fine you know to the various uh, buses that are connected up here and the devices on the other side are going to get that's uh, you know those relevant signals there but then when the output enables switched off and stuff and then the cpu on this side of the data bus here is doing something else these latches have still got the data set in there so when the cpu comes back over here let's say the one for controlling which slots are selected it can just literally enable the output it doesn't even need to set the bits it doesn't need to know what those are if they haven't changed it can just literally just output them again yeah and the same values will be output on the other side if that makes sense so yeah it's a nice way of it's like the like registers almost you know i think correct me if you think i'm wrong um and uh, you know you've got to obviously control you know you can isolate when the output enables off this you know the, the high impedance the outputs here high impedance so other things you know on can other activity can take place on those various buses there So just coming to back to the Sega chipset, as I said I would do in uh, part one, actually in an annotation, you can see here a 3155309. So that is precisely what is on the Megatech board there. Now this is VA4 Mega Drive. This was kindly donated by the Retrologist, and actually I can send this back. Um, I'll men mention this to him later if he wants it back because I haven't had to use it. Because um, I think Electron Ash was saying that a number of times he thinks it was the 5309. Um, now, in the repair logs I saw out there, the 5308 can fail on those boards as well. But you can see straight away there, it's not got 5308. Sega did a modification when, by the time he got to the VA4, and they merged the 5308 into this device here, the 5364. But it was merged with, I'll show you, the little chip that's, I don't know how many pins it is, maybe 16 pins, that sits on the Megatech board there. It's, so, it's related to the clock stuff. I don't know, there's some clock stuff around it. Could just be a coincidence it's near the crystal, but nevertheless, that small dip chip and the 5308 were merged into the 5364. 
However, despite the fact that this is a VA4, you can see the chip there, a 315-5313. Uh, that is almost identical, well it is, it will work, it's pin compatible with the chip on the Megatech board there, you know, the main VDP. But the one on my Megatech has got an A on the end. Now it looks like it's possibly been swapped at some point, but the A and the, uh, the standard revision, I think, are pin compatible. And you can see it here, 5313A. And if I just bring this one shot, you can see 5313. But the pin out and uh, pitch and everything in the pin count is identical. So these VA4 boards are quite common actually. This is not an early revision board. This is a quite a common uh, rev. Uh, now I think it's a VA4. Yes it is. Yeah, you can see it there, VA4. Uh, so I already had one or two of these and I wasn't aware that those chips were on there. So yeah, I feel like I'm wasting the retrologist's time by sending this, but I'll, I can post this back to him. Not a problem, it was much appreciated. This board does work by the way. I tested this in advance of the Megatech board arriving, just on the basis that I thought we might need to swap that out if we can find an issue with the one that's on board. So that 315-5364 chip on the VA4, it replaces th this one here, yeah, the uh, 5308, but it also includes that. That's all it is. It's that chip and that chip. So whilst the pitch is probably different and the pin out, if you look at the pitch of that, can you see how close those pins are to each other? And compared to that, it's subtly different. This has got, I don't know, maybe an extra 20 pins or something like that. And I think it's taken into account that other, that other little dip chip I just showed you. But the interesting point with that is you could, in theory, develop a little adapter. I'm not saying it would be easy because you've got to adapt from that there, somehow solder onto the board um, to a little PCB with this IC on it and then do away with the dip chip. Now you might need two or three or four or five wires, but in theory you could, that would work. You know, because it's got the same other chips on here. You can tell straight away, 5309 and the 5313. Uh, in the Megatech case, it's an A, but A revision, but the fact the chipset is the same goes to show that you could use this to fix a Megatech, but it wouldn't be easy. So you've got to go to a VA3 or less to find a 5308. So those were like, I don't know, I think the early US and Japanese, there are some other regions like, there's some that have come from Taiwan or China, I think, that have got those uh, you know VA3 or less boards that have the 5308 on there. So earlier in part one, when I was trying to get the Mega Drive showing some signs of life, it, uh, you know, it was simple in my mind. I thought if I can work out how to reset the Mega Drive and see how that's controlled, I can just get the Mega Drive booting up myself. And that's exactly what we did. I found the SRES signal, and I can show you that on these schematics here. I did show an excerpt of this. I'm sure it's brown, um, but you can see it here. Um, it's marked there, hang on, SRES. Yeah, you can see SRES, and then you think you've got MRES, WRES or VRES, I'm not sure. But anyway, the SRES signal, system reset, um, it comes as an output of this comparator here. And if you look at its input, it's got a 10K resistor there, capacitor, uh, resistor, and a diode. So that's just like a, a time delay when you first switch the system on and it uses this comparator here. You've got VREF going in on the negative side of that comparator. Um, and it generates the SRES, System RES, I think that stands for, System Reset, which comes all the way down here, and I think this goes into there, in this case, the 5364. So, on this is the, the problem here. I can't find schematics that have the 5308 and the 5309. We can see the 5309 here. So the information that provides us with, the fact that the reset comes in here, if the, me if the system was not resetting on your board and you've got a 5308, which is what the Megatech has, you want to be looking at this chip here. If SRES is being generated correctly from the uh, CDX chip and coming in here and the system is not coming out of reset at all, you know, you don't see any attempt for the 68,000 to boot, uh, you're probably looking at the 5308. Uh, and of course, this isn't the 5308, but it's doing that same job. You know, this is, as I say, merge with the smaller chip. And I would suggest if you're working on one of these, that is a really good thing to consider doing. Do the mod I did, cut the trace here. I did experiment trying to desolder various pins of things, but you can't because it's SMD soldered straight onto the trace, and then that trace ultimately just goes to the destination. So there's no way, unless, unless you lift a pin, you know, lifting pins on quad flat packs is never a good idea unless it's like a permanent mod you're doing. And even then, I'd try and avoid doing it. I would personally prefer to cut a trace. 
Yeah, so you can see it there. It comes out of a wire here and then just goes underneath that chip. So I just soldered a little piece of wire back on there to, you know, reinstate that. But if you break that connection, and I'm not sure how clear it was in the video, but I think it was uh, this second pin down here is the one that joins to the third pin up here, which joins uh, ultimately to the S res on the 5308 down here. So there's a number of places there that you can you know join a wire and you can join back up to forget where it is you'll see it on the uh, the earlier part of the video join up to a pin here that goes to the second pin on that side there and while those two are joined together obviously you just have a black screen but if you disconnect them power the system on wait for a black screen and then just go tap You've got to be careful you don't bounce because you know if you bounce contest like you do with a switch it's that causes it to freeze but if you just carefully just touch them together without getting any contact bounce there the menu comes up and that message at the bottom right hand side of the menu screen should be flashing indicating that the z80 side on the menu hasn't crashed at all and then you should get the mega drive coming out of reset provided you've got a game down here and provided you a slot selection logic is pointing to that first slot and it should be on first power on it shouldn't you know even if there's a fault there well there could be a fault that means you point to another slot so if you weren't get any further than that you know you find that it's the the mega drive's halting at that point uh, just do make sure it's pointing at the right slot you know you could check the uh, the selection logic there you could also just try going up through the different slots there and try that process of forcing the mega drive out of a reset now besides that signal there that you know is provides the reset for the mega drive side there's also a window i don't know where it is there's a window into the mega drive address space so there's going to be a few components around here some two four fives or something uh, and some other logic that it, the menu side uses to like i say access the 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 mega drive side and ultimately i think that the first use of that is to read this chip here so it pokes a hole, if you like, into the Mega Drive address space and reads that ROM there to get the title and the text and all that sort of stuff. So it's quite clever how that works, but again, I am not sure how that's done. I have not had to dig into it. I haven't had to do any connectivity tests around that functionality, but it's worth mentioning that functionality is there. The menu side Z80 can see into the Mega Drive address space. And of course that makes it all the more important that you get the Z80 side working. If there's something going wrong with the Z80 and it's inadvertently sticking stuff in that, you know, that little window there, it's writing stuff there or interfering somehow, that's the sort of thing that caused the Mega Drive side to not boot. So I mean that's the sort of thing you could actually, you know, once you've separated that connection there, you could literally remove the Z80. You could remove its ROM. You could start removing the buffers and things that this uses, the Z80, to communicate with this side. You could more or less probably remove most of this stuff here, and I suspect that this would still boot. You could still force this out of reset. Although, having said that, uh, no, I think that's probably right. But some of this stuff here is obviously going to be for the, the selection logic down there, so you would have no uh, way of selecting the cartridge if you if you got rid of too much stuff around here, if you had a fault around here. So take what I'm saying with a pinch of salt, but you could, you know, isolate further than just cutting that trace if you thought that the menu side was somehow dragging down the Mega Drive side. So the next thing we'll do here is swap out that cap. It's uh, here, I found it. I thought I'd lost it. It took ages to find the blooming thing. Because it, it, even though it was taped on the board, it fell off and then uh, seemed to disappear for a week or two. Yeah, so it's 470 microfarad, 25 volts. Uh, yeah, you can see that the plastic there has been bashed and obviously it's just been knocked off. And you can see a bit of electrolyte under there actually. Which is no wonder because it's got electrolyte in it and then it's been pulled straight through the pins there. So uh, yeah, we'll get those out, get a new cap on. I've got a Panasonic uh, FR series here. Same rating, 470, 35 volts. I'm gonna, not going to bother swapping the other caps out. If you're going to put a board like this back into service, you'd probably want to recap the whole thing. Um, but we'll just you know clean up here. Uh, clean these contacts here and we'll get this back in. I'll test it with it Might need to increase the temperature on the iron actually. I've had it quite low while I've been working on uh, this board and as a result uh, it takes ages with uh, certain uh, You know power rails and things there even thick traces So I went up slightly on temperature there Ultimately it's the tip size, you know, you've got a really fine point like that. That's not going to pass heat through properly Yeah, that one's come out now. Can you see that? It's fallen out. Let's just see if the other one's loose. Yeah, the other one's loose as well, so hopefully that will come out. There we go. 
I'm going to clean up the board first, I think, and then we'll get that cap on. There we go, straight on, no worries. So it's slightly bigger than this one, can you see? But it's going to be fine. Just press it down. And I can do the other side. Again, heat it and press it, just to make it nice and flat. Put those points down, and just reflow to a point. The socket is a lot cleaner after having cleaned it before, actually. Um, so which way around does this go now? It goes that way, doesn't it? So I'm just looking down the side of the socket here. That's it. That's in. Um, obviously, it's going to benefit from the screws put back in, so I'll do that in a minute. But uh, initially, I'd like to just test it like this. So uh, pin one is up here the Z80 in. It might be a bit more reliable like that now because this is going to make a better connection with the socket. You can see the menu there, it's a bit over bright, it needs the resistors on it. As you can see I redid the uh, video cable there, put the resistors like that, it's just more flexible uh, and instead of having a wire going to a clip I've actually just got a clip for the uh, you know blanking, you know the RGB switching signal. And then I've also made a cable here for Neo Geo to uh, you know the controller connector this will work on either the p1 or the p2 i could just make another one of these up so i've got two of them and the original cable broke off here so i've just you know stuck that on here for the moment but there are no resistors in there at the moment so you know this is outputting ttl level but uh, i might redo this just like the other one replace those wires with some orange wires but uh, yeah it was just a quick fix you know to detach it from the board so the only other cap I'm going to replace at this point in time is that crushed one. It does look like this has been recapped actually. You know, you can see the solder points there look a bit uh, different. There's a little bit of flux of stuff around it. You know, if you just sort of wobble it a little bit on the other side, you can sort of feel when it gets to temperature. That side is freeing up. There we go, that's off. And then let's do this one. And then I can unblock the holes. Yeah, there we go. So it's 10 microfarad, 50 volts. Smells a bit that actually. So it's these two points here, and the one that's not unblocked is that one, the negative. I perhaps should reflow around the VDP here, you know, because the solder points don't look that clever on it, but. I'd rather try and avoid, um, you know, exposing it to any heat. Why risk it? Oh, it's not coming out. So what I would typically do here, because there is a little indent there where it has sucked some of the solder out from the top side here, uh, clean it all up and get the cap in position and uh, push the cap, you know, hold it in position and then just heat from the other side until it slides through. It's far easier than just continuously subjecting that small pad there to additional heat and it's the same with the pad on the other side. So it's a bit smaller this but it's a Panasonic M series, 105 degrees. Uh, 16 volts so I think the other one was 50 volts but uh, it's going to be fine the CSR is pretty low but you can see I'm just going to hold it like that heat that pin from the other side and it'll slide through yeah yeah I had to increase by 30 degrees there to get that to to go through we'll just get it back over there and test it now and then I'll uh, clean it up a bit later I mean obviously saw some cleaning earlier and just testing that uh, crushed cap, can you see here? That's kind of what I expected, instead of being 10, it's 9.5. You lose some of the capacitance, uh, and look at the ESR, 3.1 ohms. 
Uh, let's just squash it. And it's something I've never tried, if I'm honest, but it makes sense if you squash it, the plates are nearer together, you lose some capacitance. So let's just try it again. Now it's leaky, look. So yeah, that's what can happen when you crush capacitors. Oh look, it's measuring again. Now its capacitance has gone up, but it's ESR 2.8. Yeah, you wouldn't want to use a crushed capacitor, that is for sure. That one I put on is like less than 0 0.3 of an ohm. So as part of the repair of this and trying to work out what was going on, obviously I've tested various uh, replacement gals in various positions here. And I mentioned to you that I saw some sort of difference down here. I forget exactly where it was in the, the repair series, I think it was in part one. Um, I didn't notice it. I noticed that these could be dumped and there was a difference. And when I tried to replace one of the chips there, I had an issue and I thought it was just the, the fault on the board at the time. But anyway, and now we've got this up and running, obviously retested all these gals. So you can see they've all got nice white labels. You might be able to see from there. So these are replacements. When it came to this chip here, it wouldn't work. Just a black screen. So I went back to the programmer and verified it again. It was okay. Tested it again. Wouldn't work. So I reprogrammed it again. You know, raised it, programmed it again, verified it. Brought it back. Still wouldn't work. So I dumped the uh, the original one that was on here. Uh, it's not that one. It's uh, the other one. Hang on. So I dumped the original one and... Um, program that to this chip and it works now just to rule out it was a bad connection or something you know I thought what's going on here I, I, what I did is I put the public version back on there again it wouldn't work stuck the version from here on there onto that chip again and it does work so uh, there is a difference so I dumped this chip and I've compared it to the one that Porchy uh, has, uh, you know, reverse engineered and dumped himself on the website there that's public. And there are some subtle differences. We'll have a look at those in a minute. Um, it's very little. Um, the only thing I could see glancing over them is like right down the very last, one of the last lines there in the JEDEC. There was some additional zeros or something, but I'm not 100% sure what the difference actually is until I compare them. But there is definitely a fault, you know, an issue with the, the, the one that's public. So I've submitted that to the archive there and updated the wiki to say that the one from Porchy doesn't work, actually. That's a mistake. I'd updated it previously to say that they all work. And I'll show you this is working. So you can see, you know, the white prints, all the original chips were just like black like that with a very dark uh, print. So these are all white uh, the only one we haven't done is on here but that's publicly tested anyway i think porchy himself tested that that one gal there you can see in here that's working and uh, if i select the next game you know you can go through the games no problems here i've started the games i've used the controllers and things I've gone through the menus you know the, the service menu everything works so as things stand that set of gals now will work so we're at a point now where i can put this in test mode I can show you some of the test uh, features and things, you know, the things you get in the diagnostic side of things. Um, you know, it's a service menu more than anything. Uh, so let me think, I think it's pin 8 there, so if I short that to a ground here, there we go. I'm sorry about the light on the screen here, but you can see the screen. You can see I can go up and down, and this is the Mega Drive side. So if I just temporarily switch over to the Master System screen, this is what we saw before, uh, hang on, and this is what confused me. When I saw that and I couldn't do anything else, I was like, what's going on here, can't do anything. At that point in time, it switches over to the Mega Drive screen. Uh, this is where you've got to press the test button, actually. So, yeah, you don't use the button on the joystick, but you use the test button to select an option. There you go. So that's the bookkeeping, so you can see how many coins have gone through it and all that sort of stuff. Uh, second page there. Uh, I've got to press the test button again to get back to the menu. Uh, data clear, that just clears it. Input test, let's do that. So you can see a control, so we go up, down, left, right, that's all working. A, B, C. You can hold those three down at the same time, start. Now if you try holding down all four buttons, you'll see off, uh, B doesn't work, B shows us off, but if you get rid of start, um, they work. It's almost like, uh, I don't know, there's a limitation there on how many buttons it can detect at exactly the same time, it's like three out of four. But yeah, they all work, they all work. Uh, and then obviously we've got the, the service one, which is what you use to get into the menu, I think. And then the enter button, I can show you the enter button because that shouldn't take us out of there, hang on. Yeah, so you can see I'm pressing the enter button. There are two separate door switches. So on the cabinet itself, the arcade cabinet, you'd have a switch on there so you can tell whether someone's in or out of it and it may even trigger an alarm 
if uh, someone opens that, uh, you know, without being in service mode, for example. Uh, and the select button as well. I don't know where the select one is. It's uh, one of the other things I've not got wired up. You know, I'd have to connect up a wire to that select uh, strip there. I've got, obviously got select. I've got service. I don't know where enter is though. So anyway, let's just skip out of there. And I've done player two, by the way. All the inputs for player two work. So then you've got coin shoot test. Now we've not got a coin shoot connected up, so we can't do that anyway. Um, output test, so I'll show you that. I think that's for the alarms actually. So you've got a flash one. So how do you do this now? You press select to trigger it. So if I press the select thing, can you hear that? Let me just turn the sound up. You can hear that beeping. And I'll show you in a minute when we go into a game and the time runs out, that's what you hear. Uh, and then the other one, hang on, I've got to press the test button again, I'm gonna, oh, I've got to press select again. Yeah, I've got to press select again. And uh, if you go to the flash one, can you see that? What's interesting about that, this is the Mega Drive side. And also, what's interesting about this service uh, menu here that we're in, it's all run by the Mega Drive side. Now, there's no ROM on the Mega Drive side, as far as I can see. So this has all been spoon-fed through that window I was talking about, the window into the uh, 68K address space. It's been fed from the, uh, you know, the Z80 side. I mean, obviously, it's quite basic here, you know, quite basic text and stuff. There's not, not really any graphics or anything there. So within that 32K ROM, there's some code there for the Mega Drive. Uh, so how do I get out of that now? I've got to press select again. I wanna... So the next one is dip switches. Uh, so at the moment you can see they're all off. I've left them all off. Now if I switch one of them, I'll switch one of the end ones here. Did you see it change up here? Watch. It's on and now it's off. So yeah, you can change those in real time and they're reflected there. Uh, and as we change them, can you see this here change? As I change one there, look, it's saying two coins equals one credit. Change it the other way, one coin equals four credits. The majority, got another one set there as well by accident, hang on. That one's off now. Uh, yeah, so the majority of those dip switches, all they do is choose, you know, for four different coin denominations. So for example, you'd have like 10p, 20p, 50p, pound coin. Obviously in different countries, you can have different things there, like 10 cents, 20 cents, 50 cents, and a dollar or a euro or whatever. And so that's this four, I think originally on the original machine, there would be a coin uh, setup, you know, a coin hop or whatever you call it, that has four different, uh, you know, denominations of coins. And you can just specify, using these dip switches here, you can specify how many credits you get per each of those different levels of coins. And then you can also specify the time. As you can see at the bottom there, it says time, 30 seconds per credit. So yeah, just by messing around with those dip switches, let me just change one of them. Hang on, that's inhibited coin for one or two of these, let's say, will change the time. It might be the end of the second block. Let me try that. Yeah, there you go. Just move one of the, the last dip switches you can see up there, and it's jumped to four minutes 30 per credit. Uh, and obviously you can get in the combinations. Look, we've got three minutes 30. Uh, let's just put that last one, that one down there, one minute 30. So yeah, I'll just leave it on 30 seconds. I'm just leaving them on the defaults here, but that's basically what all of those dip switches are used for. The dip switches here are different. One of these here disables music and sound in a tracked mode. And I noticed that because I switched it before and the sound went off. Now, if you had a coin in, then the sound would come on. Yeah, so when it's just sat there in a track mode, there's no credits in, you can disable the sound. Uh, and then I think one of the other ones here is for mono and stereo. You can configure the, you know, the output here, the audio, either mono or stereo. Uh, one of them is not used, I think, and then the other one is for the region. Oh, it might be there's two for the region, actually, now I think about it. So, you know, you can change it between US, uh, Japanese, and PAL, I think. Something like that. Um, but I've just, again, left it on the defaults. I'm assuming that if I switch these switches up, I may find that carts don't work or something like that. I don't think there was a US release. I think only a handful of these systems made it to the US. There's probably, I don't know, five or ten at most. Well, I read an article somewhere that said there's as little as three or four over there. Um, because it just wasn't sold there and they were quite rare to start with you know they weren't that popular in the UK anyway that's, that's the dip switches let's just press the test again uh, alarm time set so let's just do that so this is useful so that flashing and the alarm tone you can increase how long that you know the, how long in advance that sounds or flashes so you could set that to 30 seconds so they can you know they get uh, I don't know do that to 20 let's say and set the flashing to 30. Let's see if we can just take a credit in and I'll show you how it works. 
So 30 seconds before you run out of credits, it's going to start flashing, and then tw uh, when it gets down to 20 seconds, it's going to make an audible noise. And of course, these settings are saved into SRAM probably, and uh, held. So if I just press that again, it should exit. They are held by the uh, supercapacitor on there. So if I was going to put this back into you know full service in an arcade. Uh, I would want to change that super cap probably. Let's just turn that down a smidge. So I'm just going to go back to the menu screen so we can see how many credits there are and we'll try and stick the credit in. And the way you do that when without the coin hopper, because the coin hopper connects to that little PCB that goes over the top of the menu Z80. So we can't do that. But what we can do is you can press the service button. So the service button is pin 13. Just watch the time in the bottom left. I'm just going to short to it. See it up, looks got 29 seconds, minute, minute and a half, two minutes, two and a half minutes. So we've got two and a half minutes of, uh, so we've got uh, just roughly two and a half minutes of time there. If I switch back to the Mega Drive side, we can then select the game and press start. Bear in mind, it's counting down all the while this is going on, isn't it? Yeah, there we go. So we'll hit start on the Mega Drive controller, there you go. We can uh, just use it just like a Mega Drive at home. So we'll go into Arcade. I'll go with the Fiery Red Lady. So I've turned it up a little bit. I'm going to play through this. I'm not going to show you all of this. I'll just uh, start the recording again, you know, show you what's going on. Just as the warnings come on for the flashing uh, and the sound one. There we go, can you see the flashing? And then as we get down to 20 seconds, it should start beeping. Hear that beeping? And of course, if you don't get a credit in now, before that 20 second beeping countdown, you just get a reset and you're locked out. There you go lost control. My screen goes blue there, but you'd normally see it black. When you see it say time up, that was um, injected, if you like, from the master system menu. Yeah, I don't think it's doing any clever video overlay or anything there. I think it's literally stopping the Mega Drive, telling the Mega Drive what to do. I think that's what's going on there. I think that you know it's passing some code over. I could be wrong, but I suspect that's what's happening. But it could be that the video is somehow uh, overlaid. Maybe there's an IC there that feeds the, the RGB through and it's kind of like uh, you know an on-screen display kind of thing. You've got a black screen because the Mega Drive's held in reset and then it's output in the video. I don't know which way that is. Let me know below if you know how that works, but I'm guessing it's actually just injecting some code into the Mega Drive site to display that timeout message. And I think it does the same thing with the diagnostics, you know, not diagnostics, the service menu. But anyway, very, very cool. So with regards to the controller inputs, there's going to be no uh, muxing or demuxing going on at all. You know, I was thinking they're exploded out here, maybe they get uh, multiplexed, but that's not going to happen because I think there's only uh, three buttons, isn't there? So you've got uh, up, down, left, right, uh, A, B, C, D, start. There's probably enough connections there anyway. Uh, and it's not like on the Genesis where you've got a six button controller where you've only got nine connections and you need to do some multiplexing. So yeah, they're just going almost straight through. But when I say almost, if you think about it, when you've not got a credit in there, the, you can't press the start button. So something here, you know, is enabling, you know, a pass through of those controls. They might be going through a 245 or something like that that's, uh, you know, only, uh, its output's only enabled at the point um, you've got a credit in. So as I mentioned a number of times, Electron Ash purchased this board originally to reverse engineer it and uh, he's allowed me to share this with you. So you can see, you know, a partial um, board layout here. And just moving the camera across there, you can see we've got some of the chips in the middle there. I think that's the 68,000, Z80, a couple of gals, I think, and more 74 logic and stuff up there, and the other gal. Um, but the main thing is it's got all of the cart uh, connectivity here. On the schematic view, if we zoom in here, and I'll scroll up a little bit. I'm sorry, it's uh, flickering a bit on this uh, monitor here. Yeah, you can see these are the cart slots, so it's, it's handily labelled everything up here. There's a few that have not got any connections there, but those might be no connects. In fact, they aren't no connects because you can see it says like reset question marks. So there are some question marks on there. It's not complete. It may not be accurate, but for all the things I needed this for, it was pretty useful actually. Uh, you know, the cart detection pin there is MRES cart. 
so it knows whether there's a car in there. I think that's the right one. Um, and obviously the output enables and things as well. So yeah, very, very useful. And you can see the same thing on the other chips on here and stuff. He's, you know, he's labeled up what he can. There are some that say no connection, whereas no, they are connected, but you know, he's not got around to finishing them off. And there are quite a few on here. So it is a really good head start. These are useful. This is where we're looking at those selects. When I was like looking at the 138s and I was like, uh, you know, trying to understand uh, what controls the output enables in the car, so it's these. And that was the clue. As soon as I saw the slot cell there, and I think there's one over here that does the same, the menu selection ones, I knew that these 138s were where I needed to look in order to increment the, the you know, which slot we're looking at. So a massive thanks there to Electronash for sharing that with me and allowing me to share it with you. So because I've only got four carts here, I've tested them in every slot and I've, you know, as you can see here, I'm doing the uh, odd slots and I've done the even slots and they just work. It doesn't matter which carts you put in what slots, you do get every cart working. So I'm confident that this board is, uh, you know, is completely dealt with now. Everything is 100% on it. Um, if you're going to put this into service, let me just test the power. If you were going to put this into service, you'd want to replace the capacitors without a doubt. You would want to replace both of these sockets on here, you know, the one on the board for that, the CPU and the, the, the ROM as well. Those are things that I would do if I was going to put this into an arcade cab. I've ordered some nice transparent red Mega Drive shells for these cars, actually, uh, and I'm waiting to order four more PCBs and I'll fully populate this. I might even order more than four, I might order six, because I think I've ordered two extra shells. But I'll revisit that in another video, I think. It'll just be a follow-up, you know, how to program these cars and how to tweak uh, your own game kind of thing, you know. Obviously, you're limited. I think you can only go up to, like, one meg or something on here. You might be able to go two meg. You can't go much beyond that, though. I think one meg is perhaps the limit. So a huge thanks again to Electron Ash. Very, very much appreciated. I've really enjoyed this repair. It's been challenging, but it's not taxed me as much as that BBC Micro did, that's for sure. So at the end of the day, there were only sort of, I don't know, four or five different issues really, and you know, one or two of those were caps and things that we replaced. Uh, but I didn't think I was going to be able to repair this. So if anything, this is perhaps the best example on my channel of something where you can feel defeated. You know, you can look at something, it can seem totally overwhelming. You can start thinking, this is not within my realms of capability. I do not know enough to be able to tackle this. There are so many variables, there are so many question marks. It feels like the world's against you type of thing. And it just goes to show that if you persist, yeah, and you persist and you persist and you do not give up and you just go step by step by step. You know, you check your voltages, you check your clocks and then you check, even checking just uh, is the IC right? <laughs> you know, we've got the right IC here. J just stepping through the basic things, eventually you'll get to a point of, uh, you know, uh, what's the word? positivity you will actually make some progress even if it's just you've learned something you might not have solved the problems but you may have learned something and then you'll learn something else and before you know it you've got something like this where it works and it's 100 percent. and i'm like wow you know a week ago i would have uh, i was ready to just not even bother looking at it there were so many things putting me off starting to look at it i must have procrastinated over this board for about three weeks wondering where to start you know shall i shall i start what shall i do shall i order some car pcbs first because this is the other thing if you've not got a cart you can't really do much can you so you know i had to order the cart i had to order the jet the, the um, uh, gals then i had to go and find the jet and even after all that i'm like well i haven't got any schematics for this i, I still don't know where to begin with it really um so yeah you've just got to go in little pieces the partial schematics I showed you a few minutes ago from Electron Ash, very useful. Yes, it's only covering a small part. It's got some of the selection logic here. It's got some of the, a few of the gals and things, and it's got some of the main inputs and outputs, you know, the main connectivity for the, the processors and things here. And the nice thing is it's got all of the pinouts for the cart slots. That is the, the really big thing that gave me a massive head start. Even something as simple as the cart detection pin, is it CDET or MDET, I forget. Um, but that pin, if you don't know where it is, you know, you don't even know where to begin. So you've got to, uh, it's loads of guesswork. It must have taken him quite a while to um, work out the pinouts of all those things there. The pinouts for all these connectors here, you will find those online. I'll post a link down below to that as well. I think on one of the Sega uh, wikis, there's uh, you know a list of all those different connectors there and the pinouts for those. So again, that was useful. 
so I haven't actually finished cleaning the board up to its uh, final uh, state really. I'm not going to bother showing you that. I'll show you that when we do the follow up to do with the, how you program these carts and things and how you stick, you know, a slightly different game on there, etc. Because I did that with Altered Beast, by the way. The Altered Beast on here is the uh, sound or sample fixed version. You know, the sounds are clearer. Clearer samples, I think it's called. Um, it's the same game. Nothing's been modified apart from the samples. Someone, I don't know, re sampled them from the arcade version and uh, the compression is better or the routine that plays them back is better. But anyway, yeah, that'll be another video and I'll finish cleaning it off camera. It's pretty good as it is now. You know, you can see the glossiness here in between the, the slots. All of the back side of the board here is at a, a pretty good clean, but I just need to go through, uh, you know, the little gaps and the nooks and crannies and things around some of the, the chips up there. Anyway, so I do hope you found the video interesting. If you would like to support the channel, please see the coffee and Patreon links down below. I'll catch you in the next video.